last video we left off at uh, Elmwood near Pine Grove and we looked at the EMF plant. Uh, Elmwood of course is interrupted by the bypass now but before the bypass Elmwood went all the way from Black River to St. Clair River as you can see from this map here. But the map of 1894 looked a little different and as we zoom in on Elmwood here we can see that there's a racetrack at the end of it. If we were to locate it on a satellite map today, it would be right about here at the end of Elmwood at Riverside Drive, although the roads are a little bit different now, there's not a whole lot of difference. It would be about the general location of it. I found two photos from 1897 that show the racetrack. It gives you a pretty good idea of what it looked like. And in this picture, either the sun was shining very brightly or it had a, a light rain falling because if you notice, all the umbrellas of course it wasn't called a racetrack, it was called the Port Huron Driving Park and Agricultural Society. And I doubt that many people called it that. I'm sure everybody called it the racetrack. Horse racing was perhaps the most popular sport of the 19th century, and Port Huron loved its races. And that wasn't the only racetrack in town. The Swiss-born Benjamin Carr, who had been wounded while serving as a Union Cavalry officer, settled in the city and built a racetrack and hotel on Lapeer Avenue in 1876. Bert Cady, a prominent lawyer and prosecuting attorney who managed it for Carr, also managed the uh, racetrack over on Elmwood. The racetrack switched over from horse racing to auto racing in about 1911. And none other than Barney Oldfield raced there. Uh, he was a premier racing driver of his time. And here he's shown uh, in a picture with a young Henry Ford. Barney Oldfield raced the automobiles for Henry Ford and Ford Motor Company, uh, using a race car as a testing ground for Ford engines. On the opposite end of Elmwood, uh, near the St. Clair River, there's another piece of history and it's still standing. This building used to be the Grand Trunk Hotel. Notice the circular windows in the building, and in this picture, back in its heyday, that circular uh, window was covered by an awning. And as you go to the right, uh, you'll see that there's a little bit of an angle on that corner. The major difference between then and now is that angle had a peak at the top of it, which it no longer has. The hotel was located quite conveniently for the Grand Trunk employees because it was in the walking distance of the uh, Grand trunk shops and also the railroad station. The streetcar tracks ran the length of Elmwood and here you can see the streetcar and it's uh, heading toward the racetrack now. The hotel is set on the corner of Gratiot and Elmwood and a little bit further south down Gratiot about where the bridges are now. Uh, just about in this location here it's at the MacArthur House. And although it's set a ways from the river it was described in 1897 as beautifully located on the bank of Lake Huron just at the mouth of the St. Clair River and overlooking both the lake and the monstrous traffic of the river. For a pleasant outing one could not do better than to spend a few weeks at this pleasant hotel. And at the time it was probably true. We probably had an unobstructed view of the river and the lake. Just south of MacArthur House, where Gratiot turns into State, uh, at 719 State, was the number three firehouse, which would have had the responsibility for the north end of Port Huron. Just a little north of the MacArthur House, uh, set the town of Fort Gratiot, at this location here. And this is what it used to look like. Fort Gratiot was completely separate from Port Huron had its own city directory and everything. This is how Fort Gratiot was described in the 1800s. The country is one of beauty. The creator fashioned it in his smiling moments as it came from his hands before man had furrowed it with the plow and scratched it with the harrow and divided it off with fences and dotted it with barns and houses. It was one of nature's most perfect landscapes. But over the years, the town you see here has dissipated. Buildings have been torn down and other ones have taken their place, as you can see here. 
And finally, there's just this one building left. And you can see by this insert video that it's one of the original buildings. You can tell by the top of it and by the windows. All right, let's get back on Gratiot uh, heading north. Of course, you have to realize that Gratiot today isn't at all like it was in the 1800s, early 1900s, because this is what it looked like then. Here's the Fort Gratiot School. Uh, as you can see here, a uh, pretty large class. They had uh, all classes in the one school. Of course, they had more than one teacher, so it wasn't like it was a one-teacher schoolhouse. Same school, different year. The school was actually located on the north side of Cedar Street, between 1st and 2nd Street. So it wouldn't have been very far from the uh, downtown area for Gratiot. Of course, where is that uh, located? I have no idea because those uh, streets no longer exist. I would imagine 1st and 2nd Street was very close to the river. And of course, uh, Cedar was probably very close to town. I would imagine it would have been walking distance uh, to town. As we continue north on Gratiot, we come to a very pleasant place, Fort Gratiot Park. But it was an even more pleasant place years ago, judging from these postcards here. It looked like it was well kept up back then too. And they had that beautiful fountain in the center. That must have been an attraction for the, the neighbors around there. If you look beyond the fountain, uh, down the end of that sidewalk, it, that looks like a streetcar making a stop there. Across the street anyway. In the early 1900s, Port Huron seemed to have everything going for it. It had a, a good economy. It had the railroad. It had the White Star Dock that any excursion boats would stop at and people would disembark and engage in the city. It had resorts north of town on the lake. It had a first class hotel, only a few years old in the Harrington. But Port Huron's pursuit of the tourist trade faced one major obstacle. The town stunk. In 1902, city officials decided to dig a canal to dilute the putrid Black River with Lake Huron water. In hot weather, the stench often became so overpowering that residents avoided opening their windows. Gases coming off the river literally peeled the paint off downtown buildings. One of Port Huron's longtime residents who lived in that era said that uh, the odor was quite stifling on a hot, humid day. You could even see the gas coming off the surface and when the wind was in the right direction, it was pretty bad. In 1845, Daniel Harrington built a water-powered sawmill on the Black River. He improved the mill's water supply by having a large ditch cut through the swamps that separated the lake and the river. The idea of digging a canal dates at least to the 1830s, when East Coast land speculators tossed around the idea of a shipping canal with a set of locks. In a northerly wind, vessels sailing up the St. Clair River could not defeat the swift currents at the Narrows where the Blue Water Bridges now stand. The canal would have circumvented the problem. Because of construction disputes and delays, it took a decade to complete the city financed Black River Canal. By the time it opened in 1912, the canal had cost $200,000, almost $5 million in today's dollars a lot for a city budget because it was city financed. And this photo from the Times Herald shows construction on the canal about 1911. Just uh, almost when they were done, it was completed in 1912. After it was completed, uh, as you see in this picture also from the Times Herald, uh, this was taken about 1915. Today the canal looks like this or it looks like this, depending on the water level. One more thing while we're up this way, uh, over on Pine Grove, uh, up around the canal area, and this uh, photo was in my dad's collection of a toll booth. And on the back of this photo, it said, uh, toll booth by the canal. So I'm assuming that this is Pine Grove. You can see the toll gate in the distance. And you can also see a couple of chickens standing in the road. 
It wasn't unusual to have toll booths because uh, the government wasn't really building roads and so independent companies would build them, especially the plank roads. They had some money in the wood invested in those. But here's another picture that you can see from Port Huron. This is of the Riverside uh, Turnpike Company. I'm not sure where the actual toll booth was though. The city's paper industry dates to 1888 when Dr. Herman Kiefer told his son Alfred about a paper producing process he had encountered while visiting Germany. The younger Kiefer bought the patent rights and began producing wrapping paper as Michigan Sulfite Fiber Company, located right here at the bend in Black River. This photo was taken in the late 1800s at the sulfite plant. Many of his workers were immigrants from Austria and Hungary who settled the Campo community across the Black River from the factory. Men worked 11 hour shifts for 10 to 15 cents per hour and women employees received from 3 to 5 cents an hour for 10 hour shifts. In 1910, Frank Haynes opened a mill, Port Huron Paper Company, right next door to the Kiefer plant. The two paper makers merged in 1916 as Port Huron Sulfite and Paper, which uh, E.W. Kiefer, Alfred's son, would lead from 1920 until his death in 1964. Kiefer was the uh, founder of the original Port Huron Yacht Club in 1923 and organizer of the Port Huron to Mackinac sailboat race. He also sailed in the first three Port Huron to Mackinac races in 1925 to 27 and he was the longtime president of Port Huron Paper Company and also a leader in community affairs. The paper company was bought by Penn Air in 1983, E.B. Eddy in 1987, and Domtar in 1998. It wasn't at all unusual to see dredging done around the sulfite plant, uh, mainly because uh, there were some pretty large ships that docked there at least large for Black River. And here's one of them right here. Arguably the most famous ship to dock there at the Sulfite was the J.T. Wing. The Wing was the last schooner to sail the Great Lakes. It was built in Nova Scotia in 1919 as the J.O. Webster. It was built for the East African mahogany trade. It weighed 373 tons with three towering 110-foot masts meant for ocean sailing. In 1920, she was engaged to move lumber between Florida and Maine, although rumor held that her hose were more likely filled with rum than logs during Prohibition. It was said she served as mothership to a fleet of smaller rum runners. In 1935, she entered the Great Lakes to move pulpwood. Following year, two Detroit sailing enthusiasts, J.T. Wing Jr., president of J.T. Wing and Company, and company manager Greg Pickett, bought and renamed the schooner to serve as a training vessel for young sea scouts. They wanted to share their love of the lakes with the new generation and give the boys a chance to enjoy themselves and learn sea scouting firsthand. Captain George Fisher outlined the trips for the sea scouts, which were actually a division of the Boy Scouts. The ship would sail from Detroit to Port Turin, uh, then to Sault Ste. Marie where a parade would greet them, from there to Whitefish Bay on Lake Superior, then to Isle Royal for a few days, and back through the St. Mary's River to Lake Michigan, disembarking in Holland. A different group of scouts would then sail to Chicago. In this picture, she's having one of her masts replaced. The ship carried 2,000 scouts on five trips in 1940 and several in 1941 allowing the kids to dream of swashbuckling movie pirates swinging on the riggings as they learned the strange and complex art of sailing. With the onset of World War II, the ship lay idle in Marine City until 1943, when a shortage of ships caused the Chippewa Lumber Company to buy the vessel to carry lumber again. And that would have been about the time that this picture for this postcard was taken. Here she is shown in full sail coming down the St. Clair River. And if you look closely, you can see the load of wood on her deck. In 1946, the ship was donated to the Detroit Historical Society to be used as the Great Lakes Museum on Belle Isle. 
1948, she arrived at the island, which was to become her final resting place. She was hoisted up to dry land, where for eight years she was visited by the curious. She slowly rotted away. Condemned as unsafe, she was burned to the ground, November 4, 1956, in front of a crowd of 6,000. To prepare for the fire, firemen pumped 100,000 gallons of water from the ship's bilge, which took three days. They then threw in about a hundred old tires to make the fire hot enough to burn the waterlogged 12-inch square beams. Then they soaked the hull with 2,000 gallons of fuel oil. Firemen stood by with their hoses ready as police marksman Inspector Harry Reeves, shown here, fired bullets into the wing until she boiled into a mass of flame, sending heavy clouds of black smoke into the sky. Many objects from the wing reside now in the Dawson Museum built on the site where the ship rested. All right, let's head back toward town for our last stop, on the corner of 10th Avenue and Glenwood. When we looked at this corner when I was a boy growing up, uh, we saw a Peacock Lumber Company here in this corner. And from this angle, you could have looked right down River Street because river, as you can see from this yellow line, which represents river, went straight, almost intersecting with 10th, instead of curving off like you see on the satellite image here. And then the red rectangle would be Peacock Lumber. This Peacock advertisement gives you a rough idea what the office portion of Peacock Lumber looked like. In an earlier century, this uh, same area was occupied by the Haynes Lumber Company. The Haynes family was originally from New York. They were involved in the lumbering industry as far back as the records show. After coming to Michigan in 1839, James Haynes continued his activities as a lumberman and was one of the pioneers in the industry known far and wide as Uncle Jimmy. Jacob Haynes, his son, grew up and received his education in the schools of Port Huron and in 1855 graduated from what was then known as the Bryan and Stratton's Commercial College. From that time forward, for half a century, he was identified with the land and lumber business. He was also a banker engaged in real estate operations, but chiefly in handling the pine timber lands. And he was the founder of Haynes Lumber Business. Jacob Haynes was Port Churin's first millionaire. After Jacob died, the business was taken over by his son, Frank. If you recall, Frank was the one that started reporter and paper company that was right next to the sulfite, and later went on to become mayor of Port Sharon. The Haynes Lumber Company is a little bit more uh, extensive than the Peacock Lumber Company was because they had their own lumber mill right there on Black River about where this rectangle is. The Haynes home was right across the street from the lumber company and it was bordered by Glenwood and Elk and River Street. And this is their home. It housed four generations of Haynes. And although the house is a nice looking home, it was actually more beautiful on the inside. Being lumbermen, they had an assortment of different woods, the, the walnut and the oak and the mahoganies. Uh, it was beautiful inside just from the wood itself. One of the Haynes women that lived there described the inside of the house. She recalls the immense plastered attic that was used for storage and playroom for the young boys. She remembers the enormous bare rug that appeared so vulnerable at the head of the gleaming oak stairway, and the music room with the grand piano of rosewood and mother of pearl keys. There was a fireplace in the library that took up almost the whole wall. The fireplace had large lion's heads that were carved into it. There was also a large library table that had matching lion's heads carved into that as well. There was leaded glass windows that separated the foyer from the large oak staircase. There was also an elevator that went from the first floor to the sitting room on the second floor. It also had marble bathrooms with one of the bathrooms having a seven foot pewter tub. The Haynes family added to their home with this beautiful turret on the corner. She told of the oval-shaped aquarium situated in the turret of the upstairs room. It was enclosed in glass with wrought iron dragons and goldfish that were transferred in warmer weather to the waters of the outdoor fountain. 
They had a pretty neat driveway too. It was a wood peg driveway and it had a device in it that when the horses went over it, they tripped it and automatically opened the gates of the wooden fence surrounding the grounds. Eventually the house was sold and made into five apartments and, and later it was demolished. The Haynes property also included this space here, which is now Haynes Park. So where did Haynes Park get its name? Well, you guessed it, from the Haynes. This concludes the first half of our series, Port Huron Past and Present. This half was from the Four Corners North, and in our next video, uh, we'll start with the Four Corners again and we'll work our way south.